Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs in New South Wales. It's a great pleasure as we begin to move out of the COVID regime to see such a large audience with us here in the hall. Welcome. And welcome, too, to our online audience. Again, good to have you with us. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Is it, our speaker tonight is Dr. Nesha McDonough. Dr. McDonough is an academic at the University of Adelaide. I won't go through his substantial qualifications, but the key point is that he's an experienced analyst, analyst of international economics and historical and social issues. His topic is China-EU economic relations, geo-economic competition, and rival models of capitalism. Dr. McDonough will speak for half an hour or so, and we'll then open the meeting up for questions and discussions. Without further ado, over to Dr. McDonough. Okay, thank you very much, Ian, for that welcome. It's a really a pleasure to be here today and to speak to the NSW branch of the AIIA. Uh, I have a very topical topic for tonight. Um, everyone's seen these issues playing out in the news over the last number of years in the politics of international relations. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about, as Ian said, the EU-China economic relationship and where that's at, some of the tensions. And I'm going to do that through a case study of investment screening. So I'll just note that today I'm speaking uh, as a lecturer from the University of Adelaide, and this is a, a part of my research program there at the moment. So tonight, uh, there'll be three parts to this talk. I'll give a bit of the historical context of the relationship, where it came from to, to where it's developed today. And a lot of this will also be connectable to issues with other uh, liberal democracies in China and some of the tensions there. I'll also talk about the risks and responses to system rivalry in the economic sense. Uh, and I'll also then I'll, I'll identify the, the foreign direct investment uh, relationship to that, what the EU is doing with that and why. And then I'll talk about how that uh, response fits with the risks that are, arise from China's unique form of what we can call a socialist market economy. All right, so as I said, let's get into a little bit of the historical context here. History is important to understand where we came from. So we're, we've moved from what was known as the engagement strategy in the 1990s uh, to systemic rivalry for around 2017. I mean, you can pick your date. It's somewhere around 2015, 2018, for, depending on the country. But that's when there really there was a shift in rhetoric. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the resurgence of grand power rivalry, geopolitics. Some of the issues that the EU started to become concerned with was China's assertiveness in the South China Sea. Uh, things like Ch uh, the Nine Dash map, the, the Nine Dash line that claimed the whole sea for itself. That's refusal to abide by the United Nations Convention on, on the Law of the Sea. So again, rejecting international laws that, that the system that other states were abiding by. Uh, these were some of the issues and that assertiveness uh, that started to be, become uh, a problem for EU members. Then the economics, yeah, the system rivalry. So this has been a long run intentions about the role of the state in the economy, unfair advantages accrued from subsidies, uh, non-reciprocal access. We get into some of these issues. And then the third one is values. There's conflicting social and political values. Um, between the EU and China, and it often raises these in the bilateral relationship, and that generates tensions. China doesn't like others making comments on issues such as Xinjiang, for example, uh, workers' rights, these kind of things. So there's some of the core factors. Again, you would be able to translate those to other bilateral China liberal democracy uh, relationships. So if we look at this, what was the or original engagement strategy? So this was the idea, of essentially, you can capture it quite nicely by Campbell and Ratner here, deepening commercial, diplomatic, and cultural ties would transform China's internal development and external behavior. Now, in Germany, this was called Wandel durch Handel, change through trade. 
And it was the idea that you could socialize other countries that were developing countries, maybe a bit authoritarian, maybe weren't quite up to spec on the human rights values. And you built that commercial relationship. It's a win-win situation. You incentivize them to come on a journey that's going to be positive uh, and going to transform them. So this was really the narrative. So people think in narratives, right? Policymakers, business people, we all think in narrative and that's how we create our, our willingness to act in the world. So that narrative dominated the 1990s to 2000s and that's why the US and the EU in particular were willing to allow China to join the WTO despite the fact that it was Communist Party, heavily state-led uh, and there was lots of planning and it was a socialist type uh, ideology dominant there. So it was the idea that the trend is going the right way, we can ignore some things and work, work with China on that. So we've gone from engage, engagement to reassessment. So this is the transformation period, the mid 2010s, there's a realization, the change is not going quite the way people wanted it to. Trump catalyzes a shift in Washington, but he's not the cause of this. The, the underlying tensions are the cause of this. He was just a catalyst, all right? Uh, other liberal democracies, including EU members, were also having and are continuing to have their own reassessment. So it's around this time that a new view begins to take hold. So we see the trade war breaks out uh, against China. Trump starts uh, put, slapping these tariffs on. So to try and reduce the trade deficit, it actually got bigger during that period. The tariffs didn't work at all. Australia bans Huawei. Look, this was quite a, a, a novel and in some ways radical move. The first country to do that, having built a very positive relationship for quite some time during the 2010s having done the trade agreement, uh, bilateral trade agreement with China and a massive trade relationship, and yet it still made that move and it was obviously going to cause big friction in the, in, the, in the relationship and other countries have followed suit since. This will go back to the state and the economy. The EU released a very significant China outlook paper in 2019 where it came up with this term systemic rival. We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. Sorry. And also another one was the trilateral cooperation. So this was the EU, US, and Japan. And they released three straight, uh, statements in 2019 to 2020. And they were really condemning uh, the state subsidies, the unfair competition, uh, that China hadn't really given the access they had promised it would in the WTO. So really, they were just drawing out that idea that this systemic rivalry is just, we're not willing to kind of look away at the issues anymore because we don't think the trend's positive. So again, it's a big narrative shift, and then the rhetoric is starting to be followed in incrementally by policy shifts as well. So the EU, let's focus uh, down a bit more on the EU. So the European Commission, uh, EU-China Strategic Outlook Paper in 2019. So this indicates a broader tension um, with, with democracies. It shifts to a, it's a complex uh, view, uh, and appropriately so. So they're talking about, okay, China is a cooperating partner. We have common objectives, shared interests, negotiating partner in trade agreements, et cetera, seeking a balance of interests. It's an economic competitor, all right? So it's starting to get the competitive side, seeking technological leadership, and all countries are doing that. But now they've added this really kind of powerful phrasing. It's a systemic rival promoting alternative modes of governance. Now, this is a big move for the EU. It's not really sucked into the same geopolitical competition that, for example, the US has in this part of the world with China and an alliance system against that. The EU has been more balanced. It's trying to stake an independent line and cooperate with China, so I think. And it's a, it's a consensus organization. There's 27 members, right? So what they said in that paper, there's a growing appreciation in Europe that the balance of challenges and opportunities presented by China has shifted. A flexible and pragmatic whole of EU approach enabling a principal defense of interests and values is required. So again, this was really outlining this shift. So the EU is uh, the biggest common market in the world. It's, uh, it's a $17 trillion dollar size economy, it's up on a par with the US and China. It's a, it's a huge trading power. It's the biggest trading entity in the world, goods and services. Um, so it's a very important player. So I really took note of this. Um, I, I was really intrigued by this notion of systemic rivalry and, and how to really understand that better. 
All right, so that kind of brings us from the engagement to where we're at. What are the risks now? So let's talk about a little bit more about uh, risks emerging from economic system rivalry. Uh, foreign direct investment is, is a key one here, so we're going to look at that. And the EU has made some big moves in that area recently. So I think that's going to be a good opportunity for us to assess the issues here. So let's begin with opportunities. Countries want FDI, right? They all want that. Um, it, it allows your economy to grow, it allows more capital to flow in, more competition for innovation and development. Uh, the EU has a long-standing preference for minimal uh, restrictions on FDI, and that, so that's between members, there's, there's very little restrictions on capital movements within union, but also between members and third countries. All right, so it's a principally open economy. This is enshrined in the Treaty of the Functioning of the EU. Uh, if we look at the OECD's Trade Restrictive Index, we also find that the EU is one, uh, this is matched, the rhetoric matches reality. The EU is regularly shown to be one of the least restricted capital um, economies in the world. So it wants to have a foreign and direct investment. It wants to improve allocative efficiency. This is a good standard uh, economics. But there's risks here, right? So with FDI, there's risks of political influence. So China has this, uh, it was trying to divide the EU quite, quite cleverly. It had a 17 plus one dialogue with the Eastern European countries underdeveloped and was trying to bring them into the BRI, for example. So this is political influence operation. You can have strategic technology transfers. So this can, uh, again, be, uh, you can transfer technology that you didn't want to transfer, technology that maybe should be subject to export controls. So there's these kind of issues, and then there's also unfair competition, all right? So SOEs are getting money. They got quite a lot of subsidies. So for example, if a Chinese firm is bidding on some contract for government procurement, for example, uh, and they're getting subsidies, how is a, a, an EU business, or any other foreign business for that matter, supposed to compete? And there's documented cases of this occurring. So there was a whole range of issues here. There's this, uh, there's espionage issues, there's technology theft issues, there's ownership of critical infrastructure. There's been issues in that here as well, up on the top side, right, with, Dar with the Darwin port. Um, so these kind of issues were playing out in, in the EU. Now it's also worth known, for example, um, with regard to competition for, for FDI on government procurement, the EU spends around two trillion a year on government procurement, all right? It's massive. So I had opened up its economy to that. So these are the kind of risks that started to become evident because there was this intensifying competition. So in a 2017 paper, concerns have been voiced about foreign investors, notably state-owned enterprises, taking over European companies with key technologies for strategic reasons, so non-commercial otherwise. EU investors do not enjoy the same rights to invest in the country from which the investment originates. So they didn't name names, but people knew who they were talking about. All right, so, but would China use economic relations for coercive and non-commercial means? Well, we have a long history now, collated. So I'll give a couple here, but if we're thinking about geoeconomics, is, which is where uh, state actors are using economic relationships for non-commercial means and for influence. So China as a geoeconomic actor has many cases against it in the last 10 years, 15 years. So just these are just a couple. So in Japan 2010, there was a sudden reduction in rare earth export quotas because a dispute over the Senkaku Islands flared up. All right, so they just changed the quotas overnight. This had a dramatic impact on Japanese industry and production that really needed those quotas. Uh, they actually took a case to the WTO and won the case. Yeah, so the WTO ruled against China that that was illegal, what it had done. So when the issue flared up again in 2012, it changed tack and it directed SOEs to stop buying Japanese goods. So that's much harder to prove because they're, um, it's harder to have a paper trail prove that the, the, the command was given, but also the SOEs are private entities in the sense that they can, make, they can say, oh, that was just a commercial decision. Now that was, in 2012, that was uh, estimated to have cost 1% of growth for that quarter. So the another couple of issues, Vietnam, they, again, China, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese SOE was uh, uh, sent oil rigs into parts of Vietnam's e exclusive economic zone. So again, this is about using 
com ostensibly commercial actors to actually gain de facto territorial control in the South China Seas. All right, ownership is nine tenths of the law, isn't that right? Uh, so South Korea again experienced this economic coercion. There was a tourist ban over TAD missiles being located on its grounds. These were to protect against North Korea, pretty reasonable. But Beijing didn't like that and they felt it threatened its security. So they actually banned tourism, which was about one third of the market of the South Korean market was Chinese tourism. So and then the, uh, the, the lot uh, company, the South Korean company lot had a big retail operation in China. That got into all sorts of issues as well because they gave land. There's many more. We know there's been issues here in Australia as well. So that's just a small uh, um, amount of those. And the Made in China 2025, again, this was a big plan that China had made to catch up and surpass technological leadership with the EU and US. And uh, 2018, 58% of the value of Chinese FDI in Europe was related to core industries. So again, there was just a lot of evidence that China is willing to weaponize its economic relationships. So economic relationships provide opportunities, but there are also vulnerabilities in certain instances as well. So risk response. So what they decided to do was a new approach to an EU-wide FDI screening mechanism. Uh, so you screen FDI to make sure it's all good and it's commercial. So the commission proposed a regulation on establishing a common uh, framework for screening FDI. So let's talk a little bit about that now. So initially there was some skepticism. The EU again very open. Within the EU there's a spectrum of countries. Some of the, like particularly Scandinavian and the Dutch, Dutch uh, they're very much no, no, no restrictions. Let's just uh, leave it open. We want the FDI, we want the market to operate. But actually, quite quickly, and, as, and you, at that time, you got to imagine, every couple of months, the, the issues are coming out, getting more tense. It's really dramatic changes, even from 2017 to 2019, 20. So some of that initial skepticism faded away quite quickly. It was adopted by March 2019, came into effect uh, on October 2020. So this is a defensive mechanism now for this new geoeconomic era we're in. How can we protect ourselves against unwanted exploitation. That's the idea. So the EU, again, there's some serious weaknesses in the EU's current regime and continues to be. So this is a map that shows us uh, which countries have already active investment screening mechanisms, which countries don't, which countries are updating. So for example, Bulgaria, Croatia and Cyprus, they have none, all right? Uh, Portugal and Netherlands are updating. Ireland, Sweden, Denmark, Greece and Belgium also have none but are creating one. But what this means is that if it's a common market, you have a, a few leaks there. You have a few leakage points you can get in. Because once you're in, if you get into Ireland, get into Cyprus, you've access to the whole market. So these weak points are really untenable for the area we're in. And the EU is pushing strongly to actually get everyone on board to have a screening mechanism to seal off the whole block. That's not as easy as you might assume. So let's, and um, first reason is the regulation, um, its scope and aim, and particularly what the regulation is not. So it's not a mechanism authorizing the European Commission to issue binding supranational decisions. The EU has no authority to do that. Only the investment screening is an issue for the sovereign. It's an issue in national security, and within the EU, member states have not delegated the Commission to have any authority there, per se. All the states will make their own decisions over sovereign investment screening. The commission can put pressure, and if there's a few holdouts, the pressure will probably work eventually, but they still won't make the decision. That's not what the goal is. The goal is that the member states will have to make the, their decisions. So it's not a version of CFIUS in the, U, in, the, in the United States, which does have that authority, or it's not akin either to the Australian Foreign Investment uh, Review Board, the FERB. All right? So really, its function is to provide an EU-wide coordinating mechanism. It will allow collab collaboration, information sharing, and cooperation. So it's about casting a nice light, brightening up uh, the black box of investment screening in, in, the, in the EU. You've got to remember, it's 500 million people. It's 27 individual nation states. It's vast, all right? And nobody knows what everyone else is doing. So this is really important, all right? Uh, and that's their goal, essentially, in, in the first instance. So let's go through some of the uh, attempts to uh, build the blockade of Europe, if we may call it that. So some of the obligations are about, now you have to notify whether you have a screening mechanism or not, as the case is with some. You have to provide an annual report of inbound FDI. 
and when you have applied your screening mechanism, you also need to notify other members who you believe might be impacted by, by that. And in every instance, everything you notify has to go to the commission and also in some instances to member states, but the commission will aggregate everything, it'll generate constant reports, and it'll issue opinions and guidances. Now, they're not binding, but there'll be a uh, pressure to, unless you have a very strong reason not to follow that. So other members can also make comments on any FDI in their neighbors that they may think is a risk for them. And again, the EU will also, the commission will share that information. So now an interesting part here was there was a big controversy in an academic sense, but also in a policy sense over terms that were used such as security and public order. Now, so it's a, it, the regulation has a lot of stipulations, as any regulation does, but it does and about when and how and where you can apply. But it has a, it has a final kind of get-out clause that gives very broad scope. So in accordance with this regulation, member states may maintain, amend, or adopt mechanisms to screen foreign direct investments in their territory on the grounds of security or public order. Now, there's a page of definitions, and you won't find either of those concepts defined. All right? So you can define that any which way you want. It does give you some kind of factors that can help you think about it. So critical infrastructure, critical technologies, dual use goods, supplies of critical inputs, access to sensitive information, and media pluralism. All right, and also if the investor is uh, from a, a controlled by a government of a third country. So again, we can kind of get a sense with that last one in particular who that's aimed at, but also the other elements are about uh, Made in China 2025 in particular would come to mind as well. So there was people saying, oh, well, this is going to lead to protectionism. Oh, yeah, anyone can say for, oh, it's security, it's public order, and we don't need to define it. We can just make it up as we go along. We have our backstop there, yeah? So I just thought, look, that's actually missing the whole point because the problem isn't the EU. It's already a very open economy. The members want to be open. They have a history of openness. So I thought, like, that's a little bit of a kind of misleading uh, characterization. It's falling back on an old trope argument about protectionism when there's not really good evidence to suggest that's true. Also, there's a good example of where national security exceptions also exist in trade, where a trade organization has a national security exception. People haven't abused that. It's rarely applied, uh, and it's rarely challenged when it is applied. All right? So I think we've no a need to assume there's a natural transmission mechanism from a broad-based get-out clause to protectionism, because states understand that if you want, this, want a system to work, you have to be a bit reasonable with particularly those types of rules that break all the rules in a sense, yeah? So I kind of got a little bit interested in that debate and why it was happening. Um, and also I had another observation based on doing research on China over the last few years. And I thought, well, actually the times we're in, the nature of China's socialist market economy requires that type of flexibility. Uh, and I wanna, I'm gonna make the case for why I think that's the case now, so is the regulation fit for purpose in protecting against state-driven investment risks? All right, so party leadership is the hallmark of the Chinese political system. So we could uh, graph that out in a very simple way. That was actually quite uh, helpful. And also, let's use this little quote, 2017, and, and this is indicative of the way the system is set up. The party exercises overall leadership over all areas of endeavor in every part of the country. You can't miss it, can you? It's everything. It's a really reinforce that aspect. We must improve the institutions and the mechanisms for upholding party leadership. All right, so that kind of captures, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but what essentially that captures is the fact that the party is unconstrained constitutionally or by any other means in terms of how it can make laws and act and create policy within the system, at least not in any sense that's uh, relatable to a liberal democracy and a rule of law. So let's get into that in a little bit more detail. So rule of law or rule by law. All right, so let's look at the CCP's parity constitution. It's available online. I recommend reading it. It's really interesting. I also recommend reading the state constitution. They have two constitutions uh, in China. Very interesting. The states, uh, it states the CCP must develop a socialist rule of law system and build a socialist rule of law country. It also states that the party must act within the scope of the country's state constitution and the law. Sounds great, all right? It sounds very similar to what we might be familiar with 
in a rule of law system. They've got, they've got the laws in place, they have a constitution, uh, they're obviously going to be constrained. And that's what we mean in a liberal democracy. Rule of law means there's laws in place that everyone is accountable to. You cannot arbitrarily change those laws just because you want to push something through or do someone for something. Uh, there's an independent judiciary. That's what we mean there, really. That's not how things work in China. So you have a constitution without any constitutionalism. So the party has never been held accountable to any of the uh, stipulations in the state constitution. Uh, there is no independent judiciary. The judiciary is politically appointed. How could you be constitutionally checked if you've appointed all the, all the judges? So it's a formal system of rule. It's enacted for governance and bureaucratic efficiency not for the moral substance of the law. So this is a formalistic approach. It's concerned with systemic qualities of regularity and predictability rather than the moral idea of ro uh, rights, human rights, individual rights, and so forth. So China has a long tradition of that. It had a very efficient bureaucracy long before anyone in the West did. And it was a rule by law system, also known as rule by man. That was a, another way of characterizing it. As I said, no independent judiciary. Uh, in politically sensitive cases, the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission prescribes the outcome to the judges. Again, as I said, the judges, they're appointed. They understand who's in charge and what they have to do. So look, uh, uh, one lawyer based in China said it's like the 90-10 rule. 90% of the time, they'll enforce rules as they're meant to be because they've made the rules and they're good and they're efficient. 10% of the time when they need it, they'll just say no and they'll do whatever else they want to do. They won't be constrained. So the rules are there just for efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, they're not there for constraints. So it's not a rule of law system as we understand that in the West. Look at this lovely statement from the Chief Justice Zhu in 2017. We should resolutely resist erroneous influence from the West. Constitutional democracy, separation of powers and independence of the judiciary uh, they're all out in China, and they're, that's constantly stated in their leading political documents, in their ideological documents. They don't believe in those norms, they don't believe in those values, so they don't institute them. And they're very, they're very clear about that now. Uh, they have no problem telling the world that. So, Xi was hoped to be a political reformer when he entered into power, and in the economic sense that they would further liberalize in 2013. Xi has been a reformer, a fantastic reformer, but a political reformer, and not what other, others in the West would have hoped for. He has done something very different. Rather, he's uh, increased party membership, 85 million in 2013. It's now 95 million. He strengthened ideology, Marxist ideology, Leninist ideology, party discipline, training. He's used, uh, made strict use of the nomenclature system for judicial and SOE uh, leadership appointments, that was taken from the Soviet Union. He's reinvigorated the party cell system. And this is where a foreign direct investment will get interesting. So by 2017, 1.88 million private firms had created such cells. So this is over 70% of all private firms. It's an astounding figure. It includes foreign firms also. So as many analysts have now started to argue, it's pretty much difficult, if not impossible, to mark where party influence ends and, and firm autonomy begins. All right, so these are some of the uh, really powerful revo reforms that uh, Xi has pus pushed through since he's come into power. Now, this gets even more interesting. So the party as investor state. So another aspect of what he's done is so evolving from an owner. So currently in China, SOEs dominate the commanding heights still to this day. They constitute about 30% of China's GDP output. It's a vast figure. Um, so that's the owner. And then as regulator, of course, the, the party and the state has regulated the economy from day one. Now it's moved to the position of core investor in the private sector. Now, this is interesting because what this does is make the whole public-private divide even more blurry. We can all agree easily enough that, okay, we need to watch state-owned enterprises. Obviously, they could do non-commercial activities. They're deeply enmeshed with the state and its goals. But in China, the private sector, you can never tell for sure if that really is private with these reforms. So policy, policy channeling is when you would use uh, private sector to integrate or to operationalize state goals and state policy. So for example, just to give you uh, an understanding of how, this, uh, of how big um, China's position is now, 
So what it done is started to use the state uh, uh, asset management entities to invest state money, right? So basically, uh, 18.45 trillion managed by large asset management entities. So these were the, the, in this study, they looked at entities with one billion RMB or more. So of that of 18.45 trillion, state-owned, central, and local-level entities accounted for 91 percent. Private entities were around nine percent. All right. So that means the state is managing all that money. Right? It's a vast sum of money. It's dominating um, that aspect of the economy. So another aspect of what, what China does is they have special shareholdings, so they can buy 1% in a firm, and that 1% is a special sharehold, it allows them to have a position on the board. So it's direct executive authority. Another aspect is with these private, with the party cells, that they have to do ideological training, firms have to support the operations of the cells. And now you can also understand there's a, me a paperless mechanism for political um, diktats to flow from the party, into the party cells, into the business. Now, how can anybody track that and trace that? Um, so the, um, McGregor, the Australian analyst, he, he discussed that China quickly started to move to paperless methods of communicating through, through the economy and any policies that could be WTO case taken, yeah, adjudicated on. They start, they, so they shifted to remove any paper trails. So again, these mechanisms as an investor say give, give China a lot more options and it's very unclear as to when, how, and why, and to what extent these shareholdings exist. So, in conclusion, we're in a new geoeconomic era. Economic connectivity is now become, uh, from going from a great asset in the era of globalization and a win-win, it's now become a source of vulnerability. Uh, countries are creating new mechanisms to operationalize that vulnerability. Other countries are reacting to that. In particular, I think China's political economy poses very unique risks that we're still unpacking. We're un un unfolding these unique institutional architecture, the mechanisms, the policy channeling abilities. Uh, it shift from owner, regulator to investor. These are really unique, the obliteration of the public-private divide. Uh, we really have to change our own conceptual frameworks that we've internalized in the West, and we're so used to these rules and the separations of powers and so forth. They don't apply in China. They have a different system. We need to update our, our cognitive apparatuses to really grip, get to grips with that. Flexible policy tools, for example, I think with the EU case, the, the public security, uh, public order, and national security, you need those flexible tools to deal with the, the uh, flexibility of China's own setup. All right, so look, I'll leave it there, and I will look forward to any and all questions. Thank you, Nisha. So we can now turn off the PowerPoint and go over to questions, both from our audience here in the room and those of you who are online. If you're online, please address your questions using, using the Q&A function. Okay, the first question, please. Chris. Thank you for a very erudite uh, talk. Um, I read somewhere recently that there are some 140 countries signed up on the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, what's the situation in Europe with regard to participation in that and what are the significant insights that you would see from that? Yeah, thank you for that. So there has been participation. Uh, countries have signed up to that, particularly the countries from the 17 plus one block uh, in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe and the Mediterranean. So look, the European countries were very happy to engage with that when there was a positive trend in the relationship. Uh, they've signed up to, to not just the Belt and Road, but the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The UK signed up to that, Japan did. So there was a period when people were willing to sign up to these agreements um, and they were seeing positives um, and countries have had very positive economic outcomes in, in engaging with China. So there's no doubt about that. So that's happened, but there has been a shift. The 17 plus one as even before the war, uh, the Russian invasion, <coughs> that had broken down, <coughs> sorry. That had broken down 
Uh, and that's going to just fade away now, particularly because the Eastern European countries are deeply dismayed by China's implicit support of Russia, but the EU as a whole is. So I think those type of initiatives, countries are signed up, but there's nothing's going to happen of any substance there, for, for the medium term at least. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of the war now in the Ukraine, that obviously has um, brought about changes there. I was listening to a podcast about the 123rd um, China-EU meeting, but uh, I gather that for all, before Putin, um, and I will get to the question, before Putin invaded the Ukraine, or well, it began the war with the Ukraine, they had made, the Chinese and Russians had made an agreement that there was no limit to their cooperation. At the same time, the EU has six times the level of trade, or at least a consumption, of Chinese goods. Um, so I'm wondering what your perception of the future in terms of the Ukraine war, the, um, the Russian-China alignment, and the EU. Yeah, look, um, so that's a very interesting space. So, uh, as I mentioned, the EU had already been having a shifting position on China, a hardening of rhetoric, uh, and a willingness to create policies that would decouple or at least reduce the trade opportunity and trade and investment in certain areas, particularly key sectors, high end technology. That, that they've, they've really uh, portrayed their dismay with China's position on the Russia invasion. Um, and so I think it's really gonna make a relationship that was on the rocks or on a, on a negative trend go downhill a lot faster and very quickly. Now, there's vast, vast commercial interests. They're not gonna fall, they're not gonna collapse, they're not gonna be undone. There'll be, as I said, it'll be selective decoupling. The willingness to engage positively will have withered away. They were supposed to have a bilateral investment agreement that got uh, sidelined over frictions. That's, that's definitely not gonna happen now. So I think that you'll see a stalemate. They'll continue on with the uh, vast sums of trade and investment, but there won't be any progress in deepening ties. And there'll be more uh, suspicion uh, on both sides. Do we have a question online? Next question from Justin. Yeah, Jocelyn J. Councillor. Um, thank you for your talk. You moved from a sort of um, uh, system analysis to some practical issues that come up, and I thought you did it very deftly. Um, but I'm just wondering whether we should regard these two opposing systems as um, like set in concrete and not capable of change. And I don't think that we necessarily want to see, see the world in such a binary um, image. For instance, i just give you um, one example. You mentioned the port of Darwin, which is an issue that's come up in, the, in our election <laughs> campaign. Um, we in Australia have, for the, mainly over the last few decades, have been um, turning towards the kind of free market um, American style, you know, let the market dictate, and selling off state assets. And there's a good argument why uh, critical state assets like ports should not be privatized. I think the, the, the fault really is in the uh, disposal of, of state assets and going just simply to a, allowing free market forces to, to operate. And, and likewise, China is not, the, my second example, I would say China is not, or I, I take it, you know, you've got like 9% of investment through the party going to, to, into private assets. But China is is also um, deeply enmeshed in the international trade system, 
and they are very proud members of the WTO. Maybe they've got different interpretations. They're very proud of being a founding member of the United Nations uh, and even of having subscribed to the help to draft the, the, um, the original document of the Declaration on Human Rights. So there, there, there should be some place, surely, for, for a, a meeting, for a discussion for, uh, on these sort of border issues. And also, I don't think we can assume that either side is going to stay inflexibly wedded to the system as it is at the moment. I wonder what, whether you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, so look, um, we can't predict the future in social sciences. The systems are too complex. We can identify trends and we can see and try and plan for where they're going to go. And I think there's very clear trends have set in place now, and I think they're in medium term trends. It's still an open question as to how far each side will dig in, how much the tensions will ratchet up, and where there will be commonalities found with dealing with climate change or different, different issues that there can be common interests. Um, I think the idea of, of the systems, these systems being able to accommodate one another and it's, it's difficult to see how that can happen based on the past because the idea was in the West that we can accommodate China. As a, they wanted and expected it to adapt to some degree. And there's this long, there was this long-standing assumption the turn of the 20th century with the end of the Cold War that if you became a free market society, you would become a liberal democratic society eventually. And this was Fran Francis Fukuyama famously argued this with the end of history thesis. Um, that hasn't worked out. Uh, right now, I think we can be pretty confident that there's going to be a lot of tensions for the foreseeable future. Tensions were bad before the war. The war has made them far worse. So in the medium term, uh, I think I don't see much hope for positive engagement. I think uh, the most we'll hope for some sort of stable, stalemate type position. Uh, and look, we'll see. Will Xi get a third term? In the end of this year, maybe, maybe not. Uh, is a lot of this down to his particular leadership? Uh, I'm not so sure because I think he's doing a lot of things that has a lot of support within the party and a big block within the party. So if he did change, would that change the dynamic? There are fundamental tensions between core precepts about the economy, about human rights that aren't reconcilable by coming to an average position. They're too different. So the tensions to dissipate would require one side or the other saying, OK, well, actually, we're going to change our ways. We're we going to become more like you or you're going to become like us. I can't see that happening either. Um, so I guess that would be my concern that there's their fundamental tensions. OK. Um, Chris. Uh, Chris Katsuki, councillor. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. Um, one point that I found interesting, I guess, is this kind of framing of a new geoeconomic geo era. And of course, if we look back in history, there has been these instances in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Japan, and of course in the US in its early beginnings of heavy kind of domestic protect, uh, protections, strong private public relations, even collusive, you might say, to kind of boost the development. And of course, there was lots of problems with that with Japan, with South Korea. So is it, is it really a new geoeconomic era or is it just that the stakes are higher? Yeah, so every history, historical uh, period has its own characteristics and so I think with these kind of concepts when they get bandied around, people can fall into debates but they're actually talking about slightly different things. So it's how do you define geoeconomics, what exactly do you mean by that and then we could discuss that. So uh, as the concept is used today, it's very similar to economic statecraft which is as old as the state, right? So in the sense of using economic leverage for non-economic means, that's economic statecraft. In what, what we mean by geoeconomics, and it was uh, Edward Lutvak who kind of coined the idea. He said it was the, the logic of war in the grammar of commerce. And what he was trying to get at was that not that this is a totally new thing, it's that as states became in the modern era more hyper-connected economically than ever before, the cost of wage and war on someone who you're economically connected to multiply massively. 
All right, so states, big states started turning towards intensively towards using economic leverage for non-economic means. So that's all it entails is that qualitative shift in our recent era. So at different points in, pre in history going back over the last few centuries, it would have been used in different ways because of the historical character. So to really uh, draw that out, we'd have to say, well, which era are you on about modern the, the definitions for that era? That's what it means in the current era. Yep, uh, we have a question online from Philip Lawrence. He asks, uh, Deng Xiaoping said, hide your strength, bide your time. Is it now China's time and is it stoppable? Yeah, that was uh, Deng's motto and it was a wise, wise approach at the time when they were a fraction of the economic and military size of the US. So Xi has, come, has changed that and that's what the Wolf Warrior Diplomacy is about, is China has come out. We're a great power. This really got amplified in 2008. The Western system has failed. We actually saved world growth through our planning system. We were able to boost growth, and they really consolidated in their own mind that they have a better system. So they've, they're out in the world. We're a great power. Not only that, we're a returning power. We were already the middle kingdom. We were already the center of the world. We already had the most advanced bureaucracy. We were culturally more advanced than most other countries. Better techniques for creating all sorts of goods. Um, uh, so, and many European explorers recognized that when they were exploring in the 16th, 17th century. So yeah, their, their time is here in the sense that they're an emerging superpower. There's no doubt about that. Uh, will they win? I mean, I don't really understand uh, how you could answer that question. Um, there's going to be tensions. There's massive capabilities on both sides. If you're looking at a US-China sense, uh, the US has a much stronger alliance system. I mean, at the end of the day, everyone needs to avoid that because if they get into a conflict, uh, well, what's even the definition of winning? So how do you win this? What does it mean? Does it mean you get the South China Sea? They might get that, but what else are they going to get? Does it mean you control Europe and the US somehow? So again, you'd have to define what winning means. Uh, outside of that, I think it's just going to be speculative. Um, you, you've a little bit portrayed it as if it was a sort of a binary conflict between um, a state in which state-owned enterprises are extremely important um, and a, an entity that is essentially private enterprise. And I, I, I'm old enough to remember a time um, when the EU was the home to this somewhat strange but uh, actually rather successful animal called the mixed economy, um, in which there were private enterprises and state-owned enterprises. Um, is there such a binary opposition or is it rather the politics and the geopolitics that are driving this? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, there's still mixed economies in Europe today. Uh, it depending on how you define mixed economy, Australia is a mixed economy. And, and very successful ones. So the US has lots of state-owned uh, enterprises or state-supported enterprises. The global financial crisis, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, they were pumping out mortgages like there's no tomorrow. They were state back um, and, and so on and so forth. So the problem is not just the mixed economy. And even if you go back to the 1960s EU, well, uh, the, Europe, the European the members. So look at France, that was always considered a state economy. It never had more than 10% of GDP output compared to 30% with China today. But also it's the qualitative differences in the idea of rule of law. So those mixed economies in Europe, there's a proper separation between public and private. There's an independent judiciary. You know that a French firm isn't secretly doing uh, that deed, the, the bidding of the French government, nor is it uh, state-owned enterprises. There's a very strict management and governance. So there is qualitative differences there. Even if at some broader level you could say, well, there's a mixed economy, China is a mixed economy. I think once you dig into some of those other differences and the idea of party cells and firms, I mean, that's inconceivable in, in a, a European country or uh, at the US. So it's those kind of differences that I see make that very sharp distinction. Uh, even though, as you rightly pointed out, there's, there's a lot of state involvement 
in the Western economies, up to 40% of the economy can be uh, state-led expenditures on welfare as well as some of the state-owned enterprises. Next question. Uh, yes, John Connor. A really an excellent review this evening, excellent. Um, really a, a comment and a question. Uh, the Lowy Institute recently produced uh, a very excellent piece of work on the Chinese economy and, and its, um, its poss possible rates of growth. Uh, a major part of that was at least some analysis of productivity increases, which has been undertaken in other work as well. And um, uh, one of the things that struck me is that, uh, from what you've said and also what's, what's read, el read elsewhere, is that the constant politicization, politicization of economic and best particularly managerial decisions in even the smallest of enterprises it seems to me to be almost inevitably inimical to the development of greater productivity. It simply doesn't work that way because every, sta every decision, managerial decision, is going to have to take into account political input, which is not market-based and not even particularly e economic-based, but it's purely a, a, a question of power. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, look, absolutely. Everywhere in history where we see any type of socialistic heavily politicized economy uh, has been tried, it's failed. It, it just doesn't work because you're, you're going to end up with malinvestment, you're going to misplace commercial decision making. So I think that's going to be a drag on the economy going forward. I have no doubts about that and I'm sure a lot of businesses in China really are very unhappy about that. There's not a lot they can do about it. That's been Xi's reform process. His greatest fear was that the China would go the way of the USSR. They lost any kind of ideological moorings. They lost their party discipline. They didn't stand for anything in the end. That's why, that's Xi's reading of the collapse. So by politicizing the entire society, there's no way not to politicize the economy either. And all the more so because the economy is a center of power in its own right. Wealthy individuals have power to influence things, right? So a lot of the attacks you're seeing on the, on the various, on the tech sectors, on some of the big players there are also about putting them back in their place. All right, so at a certain point in time, the, the party relies on how to tolerate markets, it tolerated entrepreneurs, but it's kind of getting over that a little bit and it's put them back in their place. Jack Ma in particular, when he made those remarks at a big meeting where he criticized the, the, the central bank and some of the policy makers in the public event, he got snapped down very quickly for that. And it's about a messaging. We're in control, you will do what we need you to do, and that can only have a massive drag effect on the economy. And it'll take time for that to play out, uh, but it will play out. And we're already seeing it. There's a structural decline in growth in China that's ongoing, and um, that's very well embedded. And this, the political reforms will make that worse. Do we have another question? Whew. I hope not. <laughs> I think we had one more at the back, did we? Uh, Chris Skinner, Councillor. Uh, China is reportedly very dependent on the import of energy. Um, how do you see that playing out and, and where does the EU fit into that with their current uh, problem with uh, Russian gas and oil? Yeah, they, they are very dependent on energy imports. Um, so they're wanting to have a bigger relationship with Russia. That's going to take time. Um, you can't reverse the flow on pipes, and you can't and you can't build pipes quickly. So all of Russia's piping, in particular, is is bound was bound towards the EU. That was their biggest customer for for decades. So it's just going to take time. They're definitely wanting to build that relationship. I mean, it's interesting because it's a bit precarious for for Russia over the long term to become very dependent on China for its energy because it had a bit of a hedging uh, being able to sell to Europe, but. Now it has to make contracts with China who are pushing a very hard price, despite the high price of, of commodities. Um, Russia has a declining population, very massively so, has that massive hinterland uh, just above uh, nor northern China, and there's always kind of pressure on the borders there. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Russia has no choice now but to orientate towards China. China needs the energy, so they're going to do that. It's going to take time. So that's no fix for Russia uh, declining sales to Europe. But the relationship is building, and it brings its own international tensions between the two powers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh. A lot
lightning quick question before we lose our speaker to, to fatigue. Thank you. <laughs> I was just thinking of the dominance of um, China in terms of not um, in terms of gaining at least or importing, importing, and they have of course many mines for rare earths, but they also dominate the market. Um, so I'm making a comment, then I'll ask the question about um, production of batteries using rare earths, and also they dominate the international market in terms of solar panel production. So, what do you see the future there in terms of its overall dominance of those two areas, which are crucial to us reducing our um, impact carbon footprint? Yeah, so look, there's plans in place by many capitals on how to deal with those issues. The EU has a whole supply chain, battery supply chain plan that's very well developed and up and running. So <coughs> they're going to aim to do that. The US also has a battery supply chain uh, approach. Solar panels, I'm not so sure if they have big plans in place. I think it would be easy to ramp that up pretty quickly. The EU was once uh, pretty good at making solar panels and the US too, but they feel they actually got undercut by subsidies in the Chinese sector. So there's, there's, there's plans underway there to, to deal with that. And they're both, particularly the US and the EU are looking at ecosystem approaches. So they're going to engage the whole supply chain. All right, so where they're going to, to make sure they don't get undercut with subsidies, they might have to try and um, understand uh, the types of subsidies and block certain Chinese investments. Again, this could come down to screening or countermeasures to stop unfair competition because that would gut those uh, ecosystems again. And it's the same with critical minerals. So their plans are afoot. Um, they'll be interesting to see how those work out and how China tries to actually prevent those as well or capture the market as it has done in the past. Thank you. I'm sure Nisha won't mind sticking around for more informal conversation in a minute once he's had a chance to take, take a little sip of water. But that's the end of our formal proceedings for the moment. Next week we'll be putting out another edition of our newsletter, Columns from Glover Cottages, in which we recommend readings and broadcasts on international issues. And the following week, on Tuesday the 24th of May, we'll be having an address from James Choi, who recently completed a term as Australian Ambassador to the Republic of Korea. He's going to be talking about the consequences for the region of the uh, victory of a change of administration in the most recent uh, Korean election. I'd also like to mention that applications for our semester two interns to join us from the 1st of July are now open and they'll close at the end of the week. These are positions for undergraduate and postgraduate students interested in international affairs. Um, if you'd like to have more information, I could say if this were Adam Bantz speaking to the National Press Club, Google it. But I could more gen generously say, have a look at our website, which sets out what interns do and how to become one. But to finish our event this evening, I'd like to invite one of our current interns, Rebe Rebecca Zhang, to move a vote of thanks. Um, thanks, Ian. Um, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and also acknowledge the contribution of all the audience here tonight and online, uh, which make this conversation more engaging and comprehensive. Um, so on behalf of the AWI New South Wales, I would now like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Nisha McDonald for your time um, traveling to Sydney and addressing the Institute at this evening. Also a big thank to you for sharing your knowledge that have us gained a deeper understanding um, of the EU-China relationship from a geo-economics perspective. Um, you clearly identify the changing dynamics between uh, Brussels and Beijing and also wisely assess its potential ramification uh, for the rest of liberal democracy. Once again, on behalf of the Institute, I would now like to move a vote of thanks um, let's give a big round of applause for Dr. Nisha.